Hello and welcome to the next installment of the Ortho Real podcast. We are very excited today to have Dr. Scott Sigmund joining us. He is the original opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon, healer of knees and shoulders, both left and right. Scott, thanks for coming on. Hey, Matt, it's a pleasure to be on here. You are one of my favorite LinkedIn followers. It's always a pleasure to spend some time with you, my friend. I always enjoy it as well. I do this uh, even without the podcast, but uh, we'd love for our audience, both uh, the professional community, a lot of those folks that we interact with on LinkedIn, as well as patients and just other casual listeners to uh, get a lot out of this. So thanks for coming on. So just right out of the gate, Tell us a little bit about, uh, I guess, your career and, and your practice first. Yeah, sure. So, you know, in 10th grade, I decided I wanted to be a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon. I hurt my knee and played lacrosse, and a couple of my high school friends' fathers were orthopedic surgeons. I really sort of, you know, sort of became enamored with that process very early on and set my set my sights. And so went straight through high school, college, medical school, and uh Basically got into my orthopedic residency at the Tufts program, went and did a sports medicine fellowship at Curlin Job, which was, again, always my passion. That was my focus. That's what I knew I was going to do. So I was really you know, thrilled to have the opportunity to do a fellowship at one of the, the, the best sports programs in the country. And then basically came back and went into clinical practice. I'm in for 25 years. Love my job. I wouldn't do anything different. I have a very busy clinical practice, knees and shoulders, left and right, as you described, but do a lot of professional education. Uh, also a podcaster, as you all know, is for the Ortho Show podcast and uh, chief medical officer and founder of Ortho Laser with the Big Laser Center. So I spend a lot of time not just taking care of patients, which I also love, but it's also the other things that outside of clinical practice that really get me excited. It's a great summary to get us started, and I think that's not uh, an uncommon story with the ex-athlete and the injury and uh, transition into orthopedic surgery. So you've gotten uh, in there, too, on a little bit of a different path. How did you become the original opioid-sparing orthopedic surgeon? Yeah, so you know it was probably back in about 2014, which is – Right in the heart of it, I forget the name of the HBO documentary special that they have that's out right now, but that was right when Purdue Pharma was going crazy and there were a couple of other pharmaceutical companies. And basically, you know, man, we all got snookered, right? I mean, when I was when I was in residency in, in 95, you know, there was no understanding that opioids were addictive. It was just that they were – what we did hurt, hurt a lot, Matt, and that – what we did, we had to make sure patients were out of pain and opioids were inexpensive and really not very addictive, which was the message. And for probably the first 15 years of practice, I just was sort of walking along with everybody else. You know, pain's a vital sign. The nurses are telling me the patient needs more pain. I'm writing 60 pills, 80 pills, whatever it is. And then sort of one day, just sort of woke up and I'll never forget it. I had one patient in particular that clearly was one of these patients that you knew was, was, was a real tough patient. He would call every five days for a refill on his medication. And it got to the point where he even became belligerent and was difficult with staff. And I finally had to fire him. And uh, a month later he drove his, his car into a wall and died. He basically had an opioid overdose and, and basically just succumbed. And I think that was one of the, the first things. And then my wife's a florist of all things. And, and we live in a nice neighborhood up here in, in just north of Boston. And in one year, in about 2015, I think there were six or seven deaths in high school students who had uh, become addicted to opioids. So it was a real crisis. It was just didn't make sense. And I was really searching out ways in which we could do things differently. So talk a little bit about, I mean, I, you just hit on some things that are, that are huge for all of us. And like you said, I, I think even... I was slightly later than you in training, but same message. You know, we've got to control patients' pain. You're going to get sued if you don't. Uh, not a lot of, you know, not a lot of addiction potential with this, especially if you have a, a reason to hurt, uh, which we now know is totally false. For patients or, or healthcare consumers, if we'll call them, uh, you've, you've shared some statistics with me before, but w- what's the risk profile look like with taking these medications? And we're not talking about street drugs here. These are medications that you or I might prescribe somebody. 
Yeah, I mean, this came out of the CDC, out of their MMWR, which is sort of a weekly report that they give out for for morbidity and mortality. And the numbers that struck me the most were 6, 13, and 30. So if you gave, for example, 100 patients a 24-hour prescription of opioids, six out of 100 of those patients would still be on opioids at one year. A 10-day supply to 100 patients, 13 out of 100 are still on opioids. And if you give a month supply, literally one-third of those patients are still on opioids. So what seemed to be like this, it's not a big deal, right? It, it, it hurts for a few days. We're going to give you these medications. But literally, there's a subset of patients that are addicted after 24 hours, another subset that are you know, addicted after, you know, five. I mean, it's just the numbers are scary as to how addictive the medications were and how little we knew as prescribing physicians as to how addictive they were. And And you said it perfectly. I mean, there was a period of time 10 years ago where if I didn't write a script to a, to somebody, he could report me to the Board of Registration of Medicine and I would be put up for, for neglect because I didn't write opioid prescriptions. I mean, how amazing has the pendulum swung to the opposite side now? You know, we're, we're really very restrictive and it's actually really bad for the patients that are on chronic opioids because many doctors don't want to prescribe the chronic opioids that they require because they got addicted. So it's a, it's a complex story. I think my mission in particular, Matt, as a, as a surgeon, is that I want to get, get my patients through the perioperative experience, minimizing their exposure to opioids, getting them healed safely and effectively without having to worry about having an opioid addiction. That's our specialty. That's what we do. The chronic opioid thing is another issue, which is, is another conversation altogether. So I've got a strong interest in that as well and, and kind of adapting what you do with a lot of sports medicine. And, of course, uh, Andy Wickline's got some protocols based around this in the joint replacement space. How do we do that? How do we get patients through with uh, with little or no opioid use from these big surgeries that we do? Yeah, I mean, there's just some great things that we're doing now. I mean, people just, it's like the same pharma companies that were making all kinds of money on opioids figured out, well, maybe we should be coming up with a different strategy. And now we have some great opioid alternatives. And not, I think the first and foremost, you know, Matt, the thing that I do for my patients is communication, right? You know, you're in the room with them, you're setting them up for the surgery and you say, look, I want to talk about, you know, the plan about how we're going to manage your pain. And, and, and universally they just relax, right? Because they have friends or family that succumb to the opioid epidemic and they were scared about even doing surgery because they were worried about the opioids or is my pain going to be under control? So just having that conversation alone puts people at ease. But, you know, now we have this thing called, for example, for let's go down for knee replacements, we have this thing called Iovera, which I'm a big fan of. I've been, been using that early on for over about three or four years now. And we could freeze the nerves before surgery. You know, when we do this thing a week before there's no injections per se. It's not a medication. It doesn't it, it doesn't require oral or IV. Basically, you just sit there under local anesthesia and you freeze the nerves. It takes about 30 minutes and the nerves go to sleep for like 90 days, which really is awesome. It allows your patient to regain range of motion and movement without having all the pain. It doesn't involve the motor nerves. Right. So it doesn't affect the ability to walk or ambulate. So that's great. You know, then we're using some really cool new anesthetics. Everybody's familiar with anesthetics. You go to the dentist, they numb you up and it feels OK for a little while, but then it wears off. And the problem with anesthetics has always been how long they last. But there's a couple of new medications. There's Zen Relief that's out now, which is a which is a sort of a goo, if you will, uh, that gets placed onto the incision, which can provide three days where the pain relief. There's liposomal bupivacaine, which is known as Xperel, where we can do regional blocks, and then we can also infiltrate the skin. And, and I, you know, patients can have pain relief. And, and really now, you know, it's not uncommon, right? We see these videos on LinkedIn from Vindasa, from yourself, and from other people where Patients are walking at like five or six days without a limp, and they're not taking any any opioids. It's amazing how the, how there's been such a difference in the protocols. Yeah, the uh, the tide has definitely changed, and I, I think you touched on the key thing there too: is that a lot of patients they're anxious about the medications, but also a lot are fearful about pain, or that uh, we're not going to do something to treat that, or oh, I know you guys don't give medicine like you used to, and of course, there's a very good reason for that, but. Um, we have to, like you said, communicate and get the message out that we're filling that void. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's to the point now where you can literally look patients in the eye and say, we're going to do these three, four, five things for you. 
in the perioperative period, and we're going to try and get you off this medication, not because we're just going to keep you in pain, because you're really not necessarily going to need it. And then, and then the great thing, you know, one of the things I admire about you in particular with your social media feed is that you're really allowing patients to be able to do the talking for us, right? It's one thing for a doctor to be able to say, this is what you're going to experience. It's another thing for patients to be able to witness and watch other patients who have gone through this and talk in their own words and describe the experience that they've had. That to me is gold. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish at this point. I mean, there's still, you know, there's still outliers out there. There are some, some doctors that are still prescribing big time opioids and trying to avoid, you know, some of these opioid alternatives, but at the end of the day, the, the federal government and most of the commercial payers are now recognizing that these opioid alternatives are a little bit more expensive to use, but they really help to protect the patients. So there's a lot of uh, orthopedic surgeons in the country, a lot of really good orthopedic surgeons in the country, but clearly with opioid sparing surgery with a strong interest in laser therapy, cold laser therapy, I should say, and some of the other uh, educational ventures, you, you've gotten off the beaten path a little bit. How does how does that happen? How were you just always that hyperkinetic kid that had his desk pushed up by the teacher because he, he was going to be causing trouble? Uh, and so this is just what that looks like for you professionally, or, or did something happen and, and you started going a different route? You know, I think it's funny. I mean, when you when you stick your neck out, you know, and you're trying to be innovative in whatever that is, right, whether it's branding, marketing, or a new device, you know, more often than not, when you're really early on in, you're going to get a bunch of rotten tomatoes thrown at you, right? I mean, it's like, who are you? What are you talking about? This is new and different. And, you know, we didn't get taught this, and why are we going to do this? But at the end of the day, if you, if you stick to your guns and you're passionate about it, and then you wind up, you know, seeing some results, then what happens is you're, the, it grows. And I mean, I used to give these opioid sparing talks, Matt, and there'd be like three people in the room. They'd be like, you know, what are you talking about? This is not even an issue. Why do we have to talk about it? But then as, as the crisis got worse, uh, the room started to fill up and people started to recognize that this was something to do. And then from there, you sort of get known, you know, your brand, your professional brand, if you say you're opioid sparing. So people approach me all the time with, new and innovative techniques and ideas for uh, an an opioid alternative approach. And that's how the laser came, came about. And Ryan Mooney is now my partner in ortho laser knocked on my door. And like a lot of the things that we do, right, Matt, you can either learn stuff from, from, you know, your own experience. You can learn stuff by going to professional education courses that, you know, we're continuing medical education. And then a lot of times you can also learn from your colleagues which again, you do really well on LinkedIn, which I love watching is, you know, trying to develop consensus on difficult cases. And we do that routinely. We respect, we find surgeons and people that we respect and then we value their opinions. And one of, uh, one of the colleagues that I knew, Mark uh, Pietropoli was using laser. He had trained with Kevin Wilk at uh, the Andrews clinic downtown, down, down in your, your t- neck of the woods sure. down in Alabama. And so Kevin Wilk is probably the world's most famous physical therapist was using laser routinely for, for over a decade, getting great results. And so Mark took that with him and then was able to find this robotic laser. And then that's how I got involved. And then from there, I recognized, you know, sort of this perfect storm that laser could be this great opioid alternative option for the treatment of patients. And then can we get that out the mainstream and then talk about rotten tomatoes? That's when it was really ugly. Uh, you know, as far as even, even my partners within my practice and, and the, the gumption to try something new and different, it was, it was a struggle. So you've talked, you've got several, let's call them alternative treatments there in terms of things that would have been different from the mainstream, certainly laser therapy, but you know, Iovera, Exparel, all these things that were not around 15, 20 years ago, or however long it's been, how, how does the public, how does the healthcare consumer figure this out and, and how do we help them figure that out when, you know, with the internet, we've got the wild, wild west of everything from essential oils to stem cells to magnets to whatever. We sort of have this, this main silo of allopath, allopathic medicine that's been pills and surgery this way for however many decades and we we know that we need some different alternatives because some of the things that we do don't work well or they have issues 
but you know, it's a very open-ended question, right? How do, how do we figure out what's, what's the right stuff? And then how do we communicate that to, to patients in a way that's backed by science or, or evidence or, or that they have access to the right things? Yeah. I mean, for, for the patients in particular that are listening or for, for the listeners that, that have family members, I mean, it's okay to ask questions. I mean, I say that all the time. I mean, you know, first and foremost, you know, make sure that you you can find a doctor that you like. And that's one of the things on social media that's really changed the game for many doctors, right? So when you go in to see Dr. Matt Barber, you know, and you're, and you've been following him, you know exactly who the dude is. I mean, he, he's the, he's the, he's a nice guy. He's taking care of his patients. He cares about the welfare of his patients. He, he you know, He's going to want to see your T-shirts. He wants to know part of your life and all those things. And you you publicize that. You let people know. You they be, they become part almost become a part of your office existence by being able to show that. So so patients are are understanding of that. So you can find a doctor that you connect to by perhaps social media, LinkedIn, etc. And then certainly ask around to to the various people that are out there because the, I think that patients are so much more savvy than they used to be, right? I mean, it used to be you'd go to your primary care doctor, your primary care doctor would refer you to Dr. X because he's the knee guy in town and that's who you should go see. There were no ratings. You couldn't find out what kind of stuff that he did or didn't do. But nowadays it's like, you know, oh, you know, there's chat rooms everywhere. Who you wouldn't, you gotta go see Dr. Barber because he's awesome. This is what he does. He does all this opioid sparing stuff. So. As a patient, what I would say to you is do your homework. You know, it's okay. Go jump on, do some, look, check the ratings, check the reviews, find out the specialty. Find if you're going to have a knee replacement, make sure you go to a guy that does a lot of knee replacements, right? And then, and then when you go there, ask him a bunch of questions. Hey, doc, I'm really worried about this opioid thing. What do you do in particular to prevent me from having to use opioids and, and help me up with my outcome? So don't be shy. Ask questions to your doctor, to your other family members or patients that are around, and and then hopefully you'll, you'll be in the right place. I think you may have just hit a very simple and profound answer to what was a very rambling question there, and, and maybe that does all get back down to trust and, and making sure that you found somebody that you're comfortable with and that you can ask those questions and and find out some answers and, and, and sort of vet some of those things. Um, at, Maybe that's you've kind of touched on some of that. What if you if for a patient or a family member that's just a healthcare consumer generally in America right now, where where are we failing them, and what questions should they be asking to get better generally, or to get to the to a fix for their shoulder or for their knee, or maybe for whatever health issue they have. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think that uh, there's a lot of technology that's pushing into to the medical world at this point. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a lot more choices for doctors, right? Like, are you going to do a robotic total knee replacement? You know, what's that all about? How do I figure that out? Do I go to a doctor that does that? Does he not? Can I go to a doctor that just does standard knee replacement? Are they opioid sparing? Do they do they brand themselves as a way to help us, you know, get through successfully through through the procedure as well? So, again, I, I think that the more educated you can be, the better it is. And there's never been a time that's better on the planet for a patient to become educated in the things that they want to have done. Now, it, it may not be for everybody, but maybe your, your, your elderly mother isn't going to get on the computer and go do stuff, but you certainly can. And you can figure out who the person is that seems to be doing well and becomes popular. So I love the social media presence across all aspects of our lives at this point, right? I mean, there's just so many ways for people to figure stuff out now by just asking questions left and right. I think that's fair, and I think that gives people a lot of alternatives. And and obviously people that are maybe pushing one thing in particular or aren't as as honest or as open about things can, can sometimes polish a message and put it out there to, make it look like something that it's not. But I, I think you're right in that with a lot of social media channels and a lot of avenues, patients, if they're careful, they do have ways to check on some of these things, sort of like reading reviews on Amazon. If there are enough of them, you can, you can probably get to the heart of what you're trying to figure out. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if there's one thing that I would caution all the listeners is really, is really orthobiologics. And what is that? That's like PRP. It's like bone marrow aspirate in the, 
and the four letter word now stem cells, which we're really not allowed to use. And that market in particular is very scary. And there's, you, you talked about the wild, wild west and, and people not understanding. You really need to do your due diligence if you're going to undergo any of those treatments. First and foremost, the vast majority of them are off label for, for the use. Uh, and you have to make sure that your doctor is explaining to you why they're using the product that they are making sure that it's a safe product, making sure that it's a legal product that can be used for, for what's going on. So there's a lot of confusion there. So anyone that's thinking about PRP or stem cells, please, 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 you know, go online, figure out who your provider is. And then before you do any treatments, ask the appropriate questions about, you know, the safety and efficacy of what that doctor is doing. So that's a, that's a great one. And I would, uh, I'm right there with you because I get a lot of questions about this. We do some, uh, PRP in the practice and I've, I've offered other, uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate or things that, like you said, can, can be used with the four letter, uh, word. Um, what's your wrap for this with patients? I've, I've got knee arthritis and I come in and it's, uh, my knee's pretty cooked, but I'm, 57 and I'm still working and I'm trying, I kind of know I probably need a knee replacement, but I've had uh, steroid shots and visco supplement shots and uh, what else is out there? Dr. Sigmund, uh, give me, give me your, your wraps on this. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And and I think there's some important issues here. First and foremost, let's talk long-term strategy before we get the short-term strategy. So you know, Ms. Jones, I'm looking at you here and your BMI is about 43 and that's pretty high. And, you know, when you have, you know, that type of body mass index and weight, that puts a lot of stress and strain onto the joint. So I would highly recommend that we develop some sort of a weight loss program for you and make sure that you're getting good nutrition uh, and being able to make sure that all of the, the medical aspects of your life that can be affected and improved should be improved on. So that's the long-term strategy. At the end of the day, you know, I'm not a weight loss specialist, but if you can provide the counsel to those patients and sort of guide them through, then you can provide them some alternative short-term solutions as well. And then I go through my spiel. And so, you know, the first thing I say, well, you know, Ms. Jones, today we can give you a standard cortisone shot. And I'm like, that's pretty much for like cruises and weddings. You know, it will get you good for a period of time. Can't tell you how long, but it should get you back from the cruise okay. And and then I say, well, there's some you know, other things that are covered by the insurance. For example, there's a new long-acting cortisone shot called Zoretta, which can provide, you know, three to four months worth of pain relief fairly reliably. It's paid for by the insurance company, FDA approved. We got these gel shot things that we do. And, and for us in Massachusetts, unfortunately, Ms. Jones, that's not covered by insurance. Um, it's fallen away. But we offer that to you. And for about 400 bucks, we should be able to do some treatments to be able to help you for that. And then, you know, from there, there's a couple of other things that you can also pay out of pocket for. For example, the PRP, where we drag blood from your arm, we spin it down, they have growth factors, and we insert those into the knee joint. It's not going to repair your cartilage, but it will help with your pain and inflammation. We're big fans about trying to minimize costs for our patients. Uh, we're mostly a blue-collar neighborhood, so we charge about 500 bucks per treatment for that. We typically recommend three treatments because that's what the doctors have shown over time. Then there's this bone marrow aspirate thing, which I don't do, but I can refer you on to somebody if you'd like. It's usually about $5,000. Uh, and then we've also got my laser, which also is now uh, exciting because it's on the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery's approved guidelines for treatment. Uh, it's $60 a treatment. We recommend 10 treatments. The whole thing is 600 bucks and it can last for quite some time. And that's another option. And then we go, and that's what I do. And then, and then eventually I say, oh yeah, and by the way, you're a candidate for a knee replacement down the line, if that's what we need to do. And so we give them the menu, <laughs> you know, and then, and when they, we sort of go through it together, we negotiate a settlement. And by the end of the, uh, the office appointment, I like to have a plan. What are we going to do? That's, uh, that's sort of my, my thought process. I think that's a great way to approach it. Your uh, PRP injections, usually a series of three, I think, was it Brian Cole and the group out of Rush that, that published on that? Is that where you're, That's exactly you're getting that right. from? Lucas PRP is what we're using. Uh, he recommended the three injections. And there's more and more literature coming out now. I, I'm a believer that, you know, PRP in particular, probably bone marrow aspirate as well, will at one point be, be proven scientifically to the, ha to, the, to the pleasure of everyone or to, to the reliability of everyone, everybody recognized that it works. The problem is going to be 
that the insurance companies are not going to pay for it until it goes through a true pre-market approval trial through the FDA. And that's big time bucks. It's big time, you know, time. It can take up to a decade to go through that process to get across the finish line. So again, for the listeners that are out there, I, I think the PRP is a great option for a lot of different treatment modalities. We use it for partial tears of the rotator cuff. It can be used for tennis elbow, things along those lines. And there's been some, some good efficacy to show that it works but you're going to have to pay for it. It's not going to happen you know, anytime soon that it's going to be covered by the insurance plan. And that's been my experience. I don't know about you, Matt, but I mean, literally everybody's paying for everything now. You know, it used to be you'd have a $20 copay, but everybody's got high deductible plans and you know, sure. they pay copays and PPOs. And so no matter what, even if you're having surgery, you're winding up paying something out of pocket. So people are more familiar with that process. So having alternative options, I think, is a good thing for the patient. Absolutely, and you're absolutely right about out-of-pocket cost with that. So going back then, if we use the, the word quote-unquote stem cells, because I this is something that a lot of people are being sold sometimes and, and some of these amniotic products and other things that are, that are being advertised at, at quote-unquote stem cell clinics, what do you tell folks? So there's not a single legal product in the United States of America that is a stem cell that is uh, that is approved for use in the orthopedic condition, period. So anybody that you're going to that has a website that shows the fact that they're using stem cells and have patient testimonials on stem cells, there is no legal indication for the use of stem cells in orthopedics. And that's a tough nut to, to swallow for a lot of people because I can tell you a lot of doctors didn't even recognize that or know that the terminology, the FDA just came out with a public, uh, a, a consumer public announcement warning consumers about the fact that this is the case and that they were going to then start policing, you know, doctors websites and going to come around and start knocking on doors. So I would tell you, uh, stay away from the word stem cell, but I think all, that's also the case actually for, uh, for amniotic tissue as well, there is legal, you know, uh, legal precedence to the, for the use of PRP, DMAC, and certain adipose-derived tissues that have cells in them that can be used to treat patients that have pain and inflammation. But their actual indication, for example, PRP, the indication, the FDA indication for, for, for PRP is to augment bone marrow bone marrow aspirate. That's it. It's to make bone marrow potentially stronger when you're doing a, a you know, a, um, a, a fracture. The same thing for bone marrow aspirate concentrate. It's not indicated for the use of, of osteoarthritis of the knee, but because it has a legal precedence to be used in some other area by an FDA product, it can then be used for other indications as long as the doctor carefully describes to his patient the reason why he's using this in an off-label fashion. I think that's a very important uh, caveat. So you've touched uh, a good bit on laser therapy and a little bit about how you got interested for, you know, and, and I know exciting you've got uh, recognition by the uh, academy at this point that that's a viable treatment for knee arthritis. For people that, that this explain this process to them, you're going to shoot a laser at my joint, at my knee, at my hand. How, how does this work? So before we get to that, I want to talk, if you don't mind, I want to touch on the American Academy real quick. I because don't mind I think at that's all. A big Go issue. for it. So, because I want, I want a rising tide for all boats because you know, it wasn't just laser. So the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery has not really done a very good job in providing guidelines for orthopedic surgeons to be able to provide treatment options for osteoarthritis of the knee. They barely even recognized that a cortisone shot was an option. They basically did not like visco supplementation, and they basically gave it a very low rating. And there just wasn't a lot of guidance. So for the first time in eight years, and, they and got to together clarify, and made new I mean, guidelines. Cortisone injections for... 50 years, 75, I mean, forever. And this goes supplement or, or gel gel shots or rooster comb shots, as they're called a lot of times down here in the South, uh, 20 years, 25. I mean, everyday practice in every orthopedic surgery office in the country. But yet the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon wasn't providing any guidelines on that, which is crazy. I mean, it's our society, right? I mean, they're supposed to be able to help us you know, make, make clinical decisions. So for the first time in eight years, 
they made new guidelines. And so things like laser, for example, came on the list, as did acupuncture, uh, as did specific orthotics for the shoes, as did braces. And these are all things that we've been doing forever. But they finally looked at the literature and showed that there were some things that were having literature support. Some had, a, you know, sort of a, a lower approval rating. Others had more of a moderate. But at the end of the day, they gave a description for these things. So it's really, it's kudos to the AAOS and their, their, their committee for taking the time and energy to put this thing together. So uh, we were obviously very pleased for laser, but I think there were a lot of people across industry that were really happy to know that, that those sorts of changes had been made. So, so, you know, yeah, what, so lasers are funny, right? I mean, the funny thing about lasers is that for most people, Lasers are sort of part of medicine now, right? It's become a thing. It's like you can get your eyes done. You can get the tattoo removed. You can you can have certain surgical interventions that are done. So it's become, you know, it's become sort of a common theme. But the problem is, is that doctors in particular, especially within the orthopedic community, had no idea because it wasn't taught in medical school. There's no curriculum on this. But the first thing I always ask, you know, and I'll ask you the same question. I'm like, all right, Dr. Barber, do you believe in photosynthesis? Yes. Okay. I've had nobody say no yet when I asked that question. So why is that Why is that funny or why is that important? Well, because we're on a planet that has a sun, the light comes down, your grass grows, the leaves grow, and, you know, we, we, turn, we turn carbon dioxide into oxygen. So there, we have plants and species on the planet that react to sun all the time. So the second question I ask is, Dr. Barber, do you believe in the conversion of a sunlight needed to be able to convert vitamin D to an active metabolite in the body. I feel like the answer is yes, I do. Yeah, you definitely, that's the correct answer. This is not a multiple choice uh, question. I, I remember something about <laughs> vitamin D and uh, bone metabolism. There you go. It's harkening back to our medical school days. But again, for the listeners that may or may not know, you have to be out in the sun to be able to have vitamin D work. Uh, it has to be converted by the sunlight. So then the next question I asked everybody, you know, it shouldn't come as a, as a big surprise that a species living on a planet with a sun, that in our deepest genetic code, that we would be sensitive to light. And that's the case. Uh, the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, generates ATP, which is the energy of the cell. And if you get the right wavelength and you get it to the right level with the right amount of energy, the cells become excited. And then there's increased blood flow and they start moving a little faster and fibroblasts, which are healing cells, come in. So a lot of stuff happens. I'm sorry, I cut you off there. But so so to be clear, those those changes in the cell that we can prove that, right? Absolutely, we can prove that under absolute straightforward biology. You can take a cell, stick it under the right laser, measure the amount of ATP, and it goes up. You can scratch a, a a Petri dish with a bunch of fibroblasts on it. And if you put it under laser, the fibroblasts grow back together much faster than the one that doesn't. You can increase the temperature by a couple of degrees. You can increase blood flow. All of those things are measurable things. Uh, And then there's all kinds of little molecules that run around too. You know, in the setting of the pandemic, we all know about this cytokine storm, right? That was a very popular saying. And what are cytokines? Well, there are these proteins that can mediate inflammation. So there are ones that make inflammation and there's some that take it away. And believe it or not, the laser very specifically generates these cytokines that make inflammation go away, which uh, which is why it works for inflammatory conditions such as arthritis or tendinitis, these types of things. And so clinically, you basically, if you get the right wavelengths, we have a robotic laser map, patients sit under it, uh, basically, it does not generate any significant heat energy. It doesn't cut anybody. It doesn't burn anybody. You lay there for about eight to ten minutes, and then you get up and you walk out. Uh, and it's multiple treatments that are required. Six uh, for for sort of an acute injury. Uh, we use it for all kinds of you know athletic injuries, and then ten for more of the chronic inflammatory conditions such as arthritis or neck pain, back pain, etc. In our most recent studies, where we're, we're really very carefully assessing our, our visual analog scores for our patients as they're done, you know, with treatment, we're upwards of 85 to 90 percent uh, efficacy treating our patients. Where 85 to 90 percent of our patients are seeing significant pain relief with this laser that doesn't require needles, it doesn't require medication. So it's become it's become very popular. It's become a very sort of a the, the growth in associated, and especially in the setting of an opioid epidemic, of having this alternative treatment option has been very attractive for patients. 
and now very attractive for doctors who want to be a part of something that's new and different to be able to offer that for their patients as well. Excellent synopsis of that. Uh, what else do you tell everybody where they can find you if they want to learn more about laser therapy or get in touch with you? Well, the fro is everywhere, brother. You know that. You can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. You can DM me right on on uh, LinkedIn, Scotty Sigmund MD. You know, we're doing great. We have we have nine stores uh, open across the country. Our tenth uh, location is opening in Nashville, New Hampshire, uh, next week. Dallas is opening up uh, two weeks after that. Uh, and then we're we're really on a tear here. We've got about twenty five uh, centers at this point that are are in the process of being developed. So. You know, we're looking to partner with uh, like-minded orthopedic surgeons as well as other pain specialists and other doctors that, that recognize that they're sort of looking for alternative treatment options. And one of the other things that we've really done well with is for our medical device listeners that are out there as well. Many of our medical device, either uh, representatives or distributors, have recognized that this is a viable option, and they're getting involved as well. So they're sort of setting up a center, if you will, and they're the managing partners, and then the physicians just sort of send patients in sort of like a like a surgery center model. So there's opportunity there for, for a lot of different uh, uh, people, but we're really excited about our, 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 our growth strategy as we move forward. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, for example, legitimizing laser as a treatment option for arthritis was huge for us. And uh, we're, we're really looking to expand and, and really get this across the country. That'll be exciting for a lot more patients to have access to this now that uh, we're seeing this as a viable treatment and for people that are looking for something that's non-surgical, non-invasive, uh, and, and can fit easily in their lifestyle. I think that'll be fantastic to see. You touched on something that I should have led with at the outset. If you are making the mistake of consuming this podcast in an audio only format get over to youtube dr scott sigmund has uh if i can say a a slightly silver but uh majestic (laughs) fro uh, that he is known for so follow the fro Uh, i I believe i heard in a podcast the other day you've actually agreed to uh donate your scalp to science after you pass on (laughs) yeah i'm not sure about that but uh but it was it was definitely mentioned by we're Coming at you from the master bedroom closet studio, which we started up in mid-pandemic, and I'm still stuck in the closet, man. I'm staying here. I'm going with it, and uh, I'm glad we're going to get some video on this, too. That's awesome. Thanks for coming on. Enjoyed it greatly, as always, Scott. Um, anything you need to uh, to tell our audience before we uh, we get going here? I know you got a hockey game to get to, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. No, it's my pleasure. What a, it's just a great opportunity to be able to share some of the things that I'm really truly passionate about. I know that you and I have shared interests a lot of, across this, so it's really you know awesome to be able to have the opportunity to be able to speak to your audience as well, so I really thank you. Thanks for coming on. Enjoyed it. Okay. Take care, everybody. Hashtag follow the fruit.